Professor, where does the power real sits in the world nowadays? Today? Well, the, uh, of course, in terms of states, uh, it's not a serious question. The United States, uh, though its power has been declining relative to others actually since the 1940s, uh, nevertheless, it remains by far the uh, most powerful, influential state in the world with incomparable advantages. Uh, within the United States itself, power is very narrowly concentrated uh, in uh, uh, a, a sector of uh, uh, oligopolistic interacting uh, 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 corporate power and extreme wealth uh, to the extent that the United States uh, its political system is by now basically a plutocracy. Most of the population is uh, irrelevant to uh, political decisions. It's very well studied in U.S. political science. In Europe, uh, power, uh, democracy has seriously declined. Uh, even uh, the Wall Street Journal, hardly a radical journal, has pointed out that in Europe, democracy has decline to the point that no matter what government is in power, communist, uh, ultra-right, nationalist, whatever it might be, they follow the same policies. Mm -hmm. Because policies are set in Brussels and by the German banks with a serious decline in democracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that one effect of that is the austerity programs, which have been devastating for a good part of Europe, uh, very beneficial to the extreme wealthy and powerful in the rest of the world, uh, there's an effort to overcome the uh, uh, horrors of the colonial past, but it's a very difficult task to take. Some interesting developments, uh, perhaps the most exciting in the past many years, is the uh, steps towards liberation of uh, South America uh, for 500 years. Since the conquistadors, South America has been, uh, the South American states have been subordinated to imperial, external imperial power last century or so, that's the United States. Uh, and internally, a uh, typical South American country was ruled by a tiny Europeanized, mostly white, white elite with enormous wealth and power that had uh, in a sea of misery and uh, uh, suffering, some of the worst in the world, and, and potentially very rich countries. And the elites were foreign oriented. Uh, their, their connections were to the imperial center. That's changed in the last 10 and 15 years in a pretty remarkable way. Does Obama have power? Does the politicians have power? Or all the establishment around Obama curtails his intentions? Around Obama? Well, uh, the politicians, of course, have power, but their power uh, resides in their relations with concentrated economic power. So take the coming election. It'll probably cost um, seven or eight billion dollars uh, just to participate in the election. Uh, that uh, essentially restricts electoral politics to very narrow sectors. And the population is aware of this. So for example, in the last election, uh, November 2014, the midterm election, if you take a look at voting participation, which has been closely analyzed, it's uh, approximately the same as it was in the early 19th century, when the franchise was limited to propertied white males. Now roughly the same voting participation. And the reason for that is a recognition, kind of tacit recognition on the part of much of the public of what uh, political scientists have demonstrated in considerable detail, that for roughly 70% of the population, the lower 70% on the income scale, their political representatives pay absolutely no attention to their opinions. So there's no correlation between public attitudes and policy. As you move up the scale, you begin to get a little more influence. Uh, 
but it's only at the very top, which is actually a fraction of 1%, that policy is pretty much set. And you see this on issue after issue. So, for example, uh, it's a familiar fact that uh, the U.S. Uh, health system is an international scandal. It's about twice the per capita uh, the cost of comparable societies, European societies, and pretty low outcomes. In fact, as I left the United States a couple of days ago, one of the headlines in the newspaper was uh, that it was re referring to a study of health of mothers, uh, that the headline was the U.S. ranks lower than Portugal. Mm -hmm. In fact, much lower. It's at the very bottom of the OECD, the rich countries. Now, what are public attitudes about this? Uh, uh, polls have been taken for 60 years. Uh, the public has been overwhelmingly in favor of a, public, a national health system of some kind. But it's not an option. In fact, it was so extreme that in at the end of the Reagan years, late 1980s, uh, about, uh, I think, 70% of the public, a good majority, uh, thought that it, there ought to be a constitutional guarantee for national health care. And about 40% of the public thought it already was in the Constitution. But it cannot enter uh, political um, discussion and debate. So when Obama presented his recent proposals, uh, at the beginning, one of the choices was what's called a public option, meaning you could be in a public system. And I think almost two-thirds of the population was in favor of that, but it was just dropped without discussion. Uh, it's a good, and the same shows on issue after issue. So, for example, on taxes, uh, for about 40 years, I suppose, uh, since polls have been taken, a large majority of the population think that taxes should go up for the wealthy, taxes go down for the wealthy. Uh, take on international affairs, uh, uh, polls about Cuba have been taken f also for about 40 years. And the public's been pretty strongly in favor of normalization. Irrelevant, you know. And this is true on issue after issue. That's why if you look at the political campaigns, look closely, they keep away from major issues. They talk about peripheral issues. Because on those you can, you know, should you have religion in the schools? Uh, uh, can you have gay marriage? Uh, things like that. But not the central issues of how policy is formulated, either domestically or internationally. Those topics are put to the side because they're, the public is considered uh, irrelevant to uh, uh, solving them. In fact, if you look at democratic theory, liberal democratic theory, um, uh, not on the right, on sort of the critical side, uh, it actually holds that uh, Leading figures, you know, Walter Lippmann, other leading intellectuals, hold that uh, the public really should be marginalized. Uh, they're what are called, uh, Lippmann called, uh, uh, ignorant and meddlesome outsiders who have to be put in their place. Policy should be made by the responsible men, the intelligent minority, us in other words. And then comes the question, who's the intelligent minority, that varies from country to country. It can be uh, you know, uh, corporate executives, it can be the uh, uh, Communist Party, it can be the guiding clerics of Iran, uh, somebody or other, but not the public. No. Professor, you just mentioned we are ruled in our days by Brussels, as you mentioned, the German central bank. Portugal faced a very heavy uh, penalty from all these uh, economical measures. What do you think should be done about this question of the, our debt? Should it be righted off? What is your perspective? My opinion is that a large part of the debt is what is technically called odious debt. Now that's a concept that was invented by the United States back in 1898 uh, when the United States uh, essentially conquered Cuba, it's called liberating Cuba, but essentially preventing Cuba from liberating itself from Spain, which is in fact what happened. Uh, the U.S. was in control of Cuba, and it did not want, Cuba had a huge debt to Spain, 
and the United States didn't want to pay it. So they declared it to be what's called odious debt, uh, meaning, which is a proper notion in my view. It meant the debt, the debt was not incurred by the people of Cuba. It was incurred by the dictators and you know the rulers, and it's not the fault of the population. So there's no reason why they should pay it. So therefore, the U.S. refused to pay the debt to Spain. And this concept of odious debt has entered international law. It's been used a number of times. Well, you take a look at the debt of the peripheral countries in Europe, um, Greece, and, and Spain, and Portugal, and Ireland. Uh, uh, the public didn't call for those debts. They were incurred by their rulers or by uh, uh, wealthy sectors that exported their capital. Or uh, uh, A lot of it is due to the machinations of the German and other banks who gave very risky loans, which means high profits and uh, now aren't being paid back, but that's their, their problem. I mean, if we lived, if anybody believed, which nobody does, if anybody believed in market principles and capitalist principles, there, there would be almost no debt. So for example, imagine that we lived in a capitalist society, which we don't. If I lend you money, and I know that you're a pretty risky borrower, so therefore I demand high interest, and I enrich myself from the interest that you're paying me, and if at some point you can't pay, if in a capitalist system it's my problem, but not in our system. In our system it's the problem of your neighbors. They have to pay. That's basically what the debt is. So in most of these countries the debt has to do with the banks. It's not the public. In Spain, for example, they had a budget surplus before the crisis. It was the banks, both the German the banks, remember, there's lenders and borrowers, they're both involved. So the northern banks, like the German banks, the French banks, they're part of this problem. The Spanish banks are the other part of the problem. Similarly in Greece, similarly in Ireland here. And uh, in a capitalist system, it's their problem, not the problem of the public. But in our system, it's the problem of the public. The public has to pay. So a lot of this should be called, you could argue about the percentages, but uh, a large part should simply be written off as odious debt. And as for the rest, uh, Europe, uh, remarkably, Europe is following much more reactionary policies than the United States. And the United States is not a model of how to behave. But uh, on this particular issue, the United States did make halting steps in a rational direction to overcome the crisis that was caused by the banks, not by the public. They caused the problem. It's subprime mortgages, so on and so forth. But they don't pay for it. The public pays for it. So the banks are bailed out. The public has to pay. Nevertheless, steps were taken, very small steps. There should have been bigger ones to stimulate the economy so there could be some kind of economic growth. And a limited amount of recovery has taken place, which is not true in Europe, uh, even in England. In England, they're barely back to the point where they were before the crash. Actually, the, the record is worse than the Great Depression in Europe, even worse. And this is because of the, uh, I mean, the, there is a rigid uh, religious ideology of market fundamentalism, which is designed so that it harms the pure, poor and benefits the rich. It's not, uh, uh, what's happening through Europe is, first of all, a serious decline in democracy, as everybody should know. Uh, but also a partial dismant partial dismantling of Europe's major contribution to contemporary civilization, the modern social democratic welfare state, mm -hmm. not destroyed but weakened by these programs. The labor is weakened, the population suffers. Uh, uh, the, the guilty parties, including the German banks, who were the lenders, they're getting off free. Uh, that it's a kind of a class war, and I should be should be viewed that way, in my opinion. Realistically, as we are ruled by Brussels and by the the central banks, do we have any hope of breaking this cycle? Do we have any hope for it?
I think the hope would be steps towards uh, cooperation among the countries that are most victimized. M my own view is that it was a it was a serious error for the Portuguese government not to support Syriza in the negotiations, current negotiations. If there had been a degree of solidarity, it might not have been enough, but it could have made a difference. Uh, if the countries separate themselves from one another and face concentrated power alone, uh, they're going to be destroyed. Uh, it takes cooperation and solidarity to try to resist concentrated power. Actually, that's what's been happening in South America. As long as the traditionally the countries of South America were very much isolated from one another, as I said, they were oriented, each one was oriented towards the imperial master in terms of capital flow, imports, uh, where your second home is, so on and so forth. As they've begun to cooperate, they're able to resist. So in, it's, it's a slow, halting, difficult problem, you know, many things going wrong, a lot, of, lot that you can criticize, but the development of organizations like uh, UNASUR, uh, Mercosur, um, CELAC, uh, which actually excludes the United States, which is pretty remarkable, uh, gives a degree of uh, support for steps towards independence and solving their tremendous internal problems. And unless something like that takes place, uh, and, and there have been efforts since, ever since the beginning of decolonization, Bandung, uh, you know, new economic order, uh, step after step has been tried, uh, mostly beaten back by uh, U.S. European power. But uh, uh, those kinds of steps, I think, are necessary in order to resist these attacks. And they should have support from substantial sectors of the population of the North who are also being hit by these policies, not to the extent of, you know, Greece, Portugal and Spain, but nevertheless uh, 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 harmed by them. In fact, the whole neoliberal program all over the world has been really an assault on the global population. Almost everywhere, populations have been harmed. Concentrated power has benefited. So in the United States, for example, uh, where the neoliberal policies are not as fierce as in Europe, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, male workers, men, working people, uh, their uh, uh, wages now are approximately what they were in the 1960s. Uh, there's been substantial economic growth, of course, productivity growth, but the results, the output has gone into very few pockets. In the last decade, maybe 5% of the population, 2% of the population get the uh, overwhelming bulk of economic growth. Uh, if you look at things like the minimum wage uh, relative to GDP, it's about half of what it was in the 1960s. And this is reflected all through the society. Uh, infrastructure collapse. Uh, uh, you can take a high-speed train from Beijing to Kazakhstan, but not from New York to Boston, uh, illustrative of how the public good is sacrificed in the interest of very concentrated wealth. Uh, since then, in the neoliberal period, since the 1970s, 80s, it's uh, primarily financial institutions, which are predatory. They don't, they don't help the economy. They pretty much harm it. And the degree to which they depart from normal, from theoretical market principles is pretty astonishing. So, for example, there was recently, a couple of years ago, a study by the IMF, International Monetary Fund, of the, uh, I think, the half dozen biggest U.S. banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Bank America, Citibank, and so on. Uh, they studied their profits. Where do their profits come from? Turns out they come almost entirely from the taxpayer a th in an indirect way. There's what amounts to a government insurance policy. It's informal, but tacit. It's called, informally, it's called too big to fail. So if you get into trouble, we'll build you out. And of course, everyone knows this. It's, and this means bailouts when something goes wrong, but that's only a small part of it.
it means the banks have access to uh, uh, a cheaper money to the higher credit ratings, the credit rating institutions, which of course know this, give them in inflated ratings. Uh, they're able to take risky and hence profitable transactions because if they collapse, they don't pay anyway, the public pays. Uh, the result is a huge subsidy to the banks. Uh, the business press estimates this at about over $80 billion a year just to the major financial institutions whose role in the economy is very mixed, uh, often harmful. And that's one of the striking developments of the neoliberal period, reflected in many, many ways. Uh, everything from infrastructure collapse to uh, uh, stagnation of wages to uh, lots of other problems. But the worst victims are, of course, the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. like Portugal. Does this lead to notation agencies having more power than politicians themselves? It's not more power, they're just totally integrated. In the United States, for example, you simply cannot run for, with very, there's a fringe of exceptions, but overwhelmingly, you simply cannot run for public office unless you have huge amounts of private, concentrated private backing. There's no other way to get the funding. Mm -hmm. And there's an almost linear relationship between campaign funding and elect electoral victory. Uh, elections are basically bought. You know. A final question, Professor. We are facing uh, Islamic State, so-called Islamic State. This picture of terrorism in the world, where does it sit? Where lands its root? Well, for one thing, we ought to be a little, we should always be cautious about the use of political terminology because almost every term in political discourse, uh, democracy, freedom, uh, market, whatever you like, has two meanings. It has its literal meaning, and it has the meaning that's used in political warfare. And terrorism is a good example. Uh, the word terrorism has a meaning. It's defined in international law and the US code and so on, but that's not the definition we're allowed to use. We, we use the word terrorism in a way which means their terrorism against us, but not our terrorism against them. That's not terrorism. So, for example, the, if we were to use the word terrorism in its literal meaning, uh, the most extreme terrorist operation in the world today would be Obama's global assassination campaign, uh, the drone campaign. I mean, if, say, uh, Iran were carrying out a campaign to assassinate uh, people throughout the world who it suspects are planning to harm them. So for example, to assassinate the uh, editors of the New York Times and the Washington Post who publish articles calling for the bombing of Iran, say, or to assassinate uh, Israeli leaders who are uh, murdering um, Iranian scientists and calling for the bombing of Iran and so on. If they were to do that, we'd call it a massive terrorist campaign. We're doing it, but we don't call it a terrorist campaign. Uh, that's, if you take a look at the formal, public, not secret, the character of the uh, drone campaign, it's aimed at killing people who are suspected of intending to harm the United States. As I say, if any other country were doing that, we'd probably have a nuclear war because it would be such massive terrorism. Uh, furthermore, this is a terrorist generating campaign. It generates terrorists. Uh, when you uh, suddenly uh, attack a Yemeni village and kill somebody, maybe the person you're aiming at, maybe not, who may be uh, who's a suspect, and maybe you kill some other people, that elicits a desire for revenge. So it increases the number of what we call terrorists. In fact, if you look at the whole war on terror, which so-called, which started uh, 15 years ago, at that time, what we call terror, this kind of retail terror, was pretty much limited to a corner of uh, tribal areas in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Now it's worldwide, West Africa, South Asia, Levant, everywhere. Uh, because that's the effect of carrying out massive terror. Now let's take the Islamic State. 
uh, if you take a look at the analyses by U.S. specialists, the, the former CIA analysts of the Middle East, people like Graham Fuller, Paul Pilar, others, they point out the obvious. They say ISIS, the Islamic State, is an outgrowth of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. The U.S. invasion of Iraq is certainly the worst crime of this millennium. It uh, killed hundreds of thousands of people, uh, uh, all kinds of torture and terror, destruction, uh, maybe four million people displaced, two million of them refugees. Uh, it incited sectarian conflict, which did not exist before. It was did not exist before. It turned into a major sectarian war, which is tearing the country apart and the region apart. Uh, this interacted. That part, that's part of the core of ISIS. There's another one. The uh, extreme, there is a, the most extreme radical fundamentalist state in the world is the major U.S. ally, Saudi Arabia. Its, uh, uh, its version of Islam is the Wahhabi Salafi version is already way out on the extreme. And uh, it's also a missionary state, so it exports Wahhabi doctrine both uh, with funding and by establishing uh, madrasas, you know, Quranic schools, mosques, clerics, uh, and so on. And it's spread over a good part of the world. Uh, ISIS is an extremist fringe of the extremist version of Islam promulgated by the leading U.S. ally in the region, Saudi Arabia, which is now also bombing Yemen and destroying what's left of that country. Well, this whole amalgam has put together a real monstrosity. There's no doubt that the Islamic State is a pretty horrible uh, development, but it has roots. Uh, and some, uh, these are not, this is not the whole story, you know, a lot of complicated, a lot of it comes out of the collapse of traditional uh, Arab and much Muslim society, which is a long story in itself, also with Im imperialist elements involved. But uh, out of that comes monstrosities like ISIS. It didn't come out of nowhere. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm.